Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Dear Ma'asuma, the show that tries to answer your deepest concerns and queries. My name is Sana Araji and we are with the one and only Ma'asuma Ja'far who will try and answer um, any of your, your concerns during this holy month of Muharram. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalamu rahmatullah. How are you again today? Alhamdulillah, how about yourself? Alhamdulillah, good. So uh, we're back for an, another show with some um, questions mm -hmm. uh, all linking to Muharram. Um, and we have um, a viewer who's, who's put this out to you. Dear Ma'asuma, why do Shias hit themselves during Muharram? Isn't this haram? Also, I heard that it is bad to fast on the 10th of Muharram. Why is that? Bismillah rahman rahim Obviously, this person is not a Shia. Um, yeah. They're coming from a different perspective. Mm. Um, so they don't understand the whole concept of matam, which is what they're referring to as hitting themselves. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to understand what matam is. And matam is literally collective grieving. So you have your personal grief, which you um, do when you hear the tragedy of Karbala and what happened on the day of Ashura and the lead up of that as well. But then you do what is called a collective grieving where you all get together and show your grief together. And the example I usually give is when you, if you look at the opposite, when you're appreciating something or when you're happy, you applaud. Mm -hmm. So you can smile and that can be you showing sort of you're happy about it. But then when you want to sort of do it collectively, then you all clap together and you applaud. Now, if you've never seen applause happening before, you would refer to that, why do people hit their hands together? Because you've not understood it. Mm. But now because it's something that is accepted and that, that people understand this is the way that you collectively show your appreciation for something, then it's not questioned. So it's the same sort of principle. I think one, we need to, as Shias, need to make people understand what Matam is all about, and it's literally collective grieving. It's, it's my way of showing the unity um, amongst people who love the Ahlul Bayt and who feel the grief of what happened to them. And also answering the, um, the uh, request of the Holy Prophet uh, under the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where, uh, you know, when he was asked what should he, you know, how could they recompense him for everything he'd done for them? And he said, I do not ask for anything except love of my near family members. So that concept of uh, muwadda towards mm -hmm. my family members, this is part of that muwadda. It's to show my love of the Ahlul Bayt, of, of the family of the Prophet, when I grieve for what happened to them. Yeah, I think one of the one of the questions that was always kind of um, asked, asked towards me was why, um, how can I put it? So, for example, during when when this martyrdom is done, like some people will say that it's it goes against the teachings of Allah. So, for example, hurting oneself is prohibited in in the Quran uh, by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So, the contradiction is what they yeah. tend to 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 raise up a lot of the time, yeah. and they'll say, "Well, how come it's okay when it's for Imam Hussein, but Allah is saying?" That so like where is where where is this coming from? So I that think understanding. yeah no it's it's a very good point and I think it, it's to understand that um, it's haram to hurt yourself when the hurt is detrimental. So there's a lot of things that we do which could be hurting us, but it's not detrimental, so it's okay. Okay. Uh, for example, eating sugar, mm. it's not good for us. We all know it's not good for us, but because it's not detrimental, unless you eat it so much that it becomes detrimental, then it becomes haram. Mm. For example, smoking. Again, yeah. once it becomes detrimental, if you've had a heart attack and the doctor tells you if you continue to smoke, uh, you will die, then it becomes haram for you to smoke. But initially, when it's not detrimental, it can st it's still bad for you. Yeah, There's no doubt about that. But it's not considered as haram because it's not detrimental. So right. it's, a, it's the same sort of principle in like, you know, whatever we do, if you do it to the extreme where it becomes detrimental, then it, can, then it becomes haram. Okay. Yeah. But at the here, what you're doing is you're you're not even hurting yourself. Most of the time, matam is not. It doesn't cause any pain at all. It's literally a symbol of the way to show collective grieving. Mm. Sometimes people will hit harder because they get um, emotional because of the 
poetry that's being recited because of, you know, sort of um, sort of putting yourself, rethinking the whole of the events of Karbala and everything that happened to these amazing people causes that grief within you. And, and you know, when you're grieving, you want to let it out. Mm. So it's a way of letting out. Also, from a psychological perspective, I was thinking about this quite a lot. Um, usually when we hear something which is quite traumatic, which brings up a lot of negative emotions like grief and, and um, frustration and, and anger, if we hold it in, it, it's quite detrimental to for our for our bodies, mm. physically for our bodies, okay. okay, as well as obviously psychologically, it's not good for us. Um, and you're told to sort of let it out, and, uh, and you know part of the counselling therapy is to talk it out mm. because you're letting out all the negative feelings. Okay, now what's supposed to happen with the grief that we feel? There's supposed to be some sort of action that comes out of it. Now generally, most people don't follow it through with an action. So we go to a majalis where we hear the events of Karbala and we cry and or we may not even cry, we may just hold it in. And all these negative feelings are inside us, which are sort of uh, feelings of sorrow and anger and frustration at what happened. And there's nowhere to let it out. Yeah. So part of the crying and part of the actual um, matam, the, the hitting of the chest, it's actually let out these negative feelings. So even if I don't take it onto the action, which is what I'm supposed to do, mm. it won't be detrimental for me because I'm not keeping it in. Yeah. So again, you can see the beauty in the matam from that perspective. It's almost like when you go and see a therapist and they and they say it's good to let it out, yeah. everything you're feeling inside, not to leave it in. It's just a different type way of, of way, way of doing out. it, but through grief over exactly. the head and base. Exactly. Right? And then so. you can't help but feel angry and frustrated and, yeah. and sorrowful when you hear all of these things. And so it's, it's important to understand that I need to let it out. But the, the, the best way to let it out is obviously once you've connected to it emotionally and intellectually, then to follow it through with action. There are, the action has to be there. Yeah. If there's no action there, then really um, we're not actually... It, it seems like there's, there's not been anything that's come out of the, the whole sacrifice. Yeah. It, if it's just about me crying, then really, what did it do? If it's just about me doing matam, then really, what did it do? It's like th there's a message there which has to be then lived. Mm. And if I'm not living it, then I'm really not fulfilling um, the the purpose behind the sacrifice. And therefore, yeah. it seems like it was, the sacrifice was in vain because of my actions not coming through. Yeah, no, So sure. it's, it's, it's remembering all of that. And I, I think, you know, having these conversations, and I'm so glad that this person's written in to ask yeah. about this, because I think, you know, by asking is, is where these dialogues will, will happen and, and these discussions will happen. Exactly. And, and it's important that they do happen because a lot of the times, you know, the sad thing is there's certain pictures that are put out on, on, on the internet, which really do no favors to the Shias. And, and um, people don't ask and they jump to conclusions and then it's like, oh, the, you know, the Shias are the ones who hit themselves and the Shias are the ones who do this and do that. But ask, have those conversations. You know, ev everyone knows a Shia, talk mm. to that Shia. And if, if, if you're a Shia and you can't explain it, then please, please, I urge that you go and start talking to people so that you can actually explain why you're doing what you're doing. Mm. Because if you're doing something and you don't, you yourself don't understand why you're doing it, then one, why are you doing it? And secondly, you know, if it doesn't make sense to you, how is it make, going to make sense to other people who are watching you? It's, it's that important. is a, quite a massive issue, actually, because when I when I first came to Shia Islam, coming from a Sunni background, when I first came to Shia Islam and I told my mum about Shia Islam, the first thing she did was Google Shia Islam. Now, her not having any Shia friends, the, f the things that came on there, she got traumatised. Yeah, of course. And this was be before she became Shia. So... Can you imagine that, like with the, with the media, all of these things? And when I went to ask a f uh, one of my Shia friends, um, who at the time I didn't know, but then because she kept it quiet, I had asked her. She didn't even explain to me. She couldn't even explain to me. And so I was confused that she was confused. And then yeah. it, this is this is what tends to happen. So if you are a Shia and you don't know, don't try and make things up yeah. because that has a ripple effect. And then or don't like, laugh it off or don't sort of, you no. know, sort of, oh, yeah, you won't understand it. No, and that happens. Oh, yeah. don't worry, you won't understand it. Or, you know, it's just something we do. It's in yeah. our culture. The, these things, but it needs to be explained because that might be someone reaching out to you who actually exactly. wants to come towards Exactly, and you've lost Islam. that opportunity. And you've like lost century. it. Yeah, for and sure. so it, it has that ripple effect. So like you said, it is something that is occurring or you know all the time. And also the going um back to the to the question, fasting on the tenth of, of Muharram, 
Sunni uh, sex or other uh, other uh, the other sex in Islam, uh, should I say, believe that it's it's very good. There's it's the word. There are certain hadiths that say that, but obviously, in, according to the Shia uh, belief, um, it's a bit different. Yeah. So I mean, how 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 do we really answer so answer that for if you look at the the, um, the hadith that talk about the fasting, it it actually sort of brings about a lot of questions because the Hadith talks about, um, and this is from our Sunni brothers and sisters books as well, mm. that the Hadith talks about the Holy Prophet when he um, migrated to Medina, there were a lot of Jews in Medina and they used to fast on the 10th of Muharram. Um, and they said that it was because of, that was when uh, Prophet Musa escaped Firon, or there was something related to Prophet Musa. I can't, um, I can't remember the ins and outs of it now, but okay. it was something to be related to do with Prophet Musa's escape from Firon. Um, and because of that, the Jews would fast on the 10th of Muharram. Now, when the, Prophet, um, when the Holy Prophet inquired and he was told this, he said, oh, that's a good idea. We should fast on this day as well. Now, according to the Shia belief, the Holy Prophet only does what God tells him to do. And if there is a direction to do something, even if it is mustahab, even if it's something that is a sunnah, it is a direction that comes from God, not from others. Mm. So this idea of the Jews telling the Prophet and the Prophet thinking it was a good idea doesn't work because for the Shias, it would be God telling the Holy Prophet, this is why you should do it and, and, and this is the reason behind it sort of thing. Yeah, not the Jews telling the, exactly. the, the Prophet. How because to, then yeah. what you're saying is the Jews knew more than the Holy Prophet. Yeah, and and that doesn't sit well because mm. the Holy Prophet has brought the perfect religion, and for a Jew then to say you know to come into Islam, they'd be like, but you didn't know everything. We had to teach you something. So why would I come into a religion where I have to teach the Prophet something? Yeah. So it, logically, it doesn't make sense as well. Um, so we reject those hadith, and and therefore we don't fast. And also, the fact that um, Imam Hussein al Islam was denied water and food and they were denied the most basic rights as a human being. It doesn't make sense for us to deny it to ourselves purposely now. Right. So most Shias will not eat or drink out of respect to the fact that, not even out of respect, it's more like you don't feel like it because you're in so much, so much grief. It's, mm -hmm. it's like when someone close to you has passed away, you don't feel like eating or drinking. Of course, yeah. So you don't tend to, but again, um, so what generally happens within the Shia uh, morning, uh, Shia uh, majalis is on the day of Ashura is usually you will go to the mosque in the morning and you will have the amals where, you know, you, you pray to Allah and you, to guide you, you know, to sort of bring that closeness to you. And, and, and there's certain salahs that you recite and duas and things like that. And then there will be a, a majalis which will go through the events of Karbala. And then there will be matam, which will show the, the so you'll, you'll cry, which is the personal grieving. And then you'll mm -hmm. have the matam, which is the collective grieving. Mm -hmm. And then and then you will be given the baruch. You'll be given a little bit of food. It will be very simple, basic food. And that is in order for you to then sort of um, be able to continue with the, the um, worshipping. Because if you don't eat, you get tired and you won't be able to. And, and, mm. and also this, this concept of we as Muslims want to give the basic rights to those people, to, to everyone. So although Imam Hussein al -Islam was denied by the Muslims, we as Muslims will make sure we give to all the Muslims around yeah. us. So yes, most, most, most Shias will not eat anything in the morning, but that's because they just don't feel like it because mm. they're so upset. It's a day of sorrow and exactly. pain. Yeah. But then you will in the afternoon when you're given, because again, to eat, when a, when a Muslim gives you food, to accept that food, it, there's a lot of barakah and blessing in that food. Mm. So you take it from that perspective and, and you eat and you eat collectively together. And yeah. then, you know, you sort of then you, you know, will most most Muslims will then go to the graveyard and remember their um, their loved ones and, and then come back uh, for the evening of um, Shama Gariba, the, the evening of, you know, what, what, what happened to the ladies of, of the household of the Prophet after yeah. the martyrs had gone. Okay. Been slain. And uh, another question um, to put forward to you. There's a common kind of misconception of uh, Shia Muslims uh, focusing a lot on Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, but not 
focusing on Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so a lot of, uh, you know, of our uh, Sunni brothers and sisters will bring this up. Mm. You know, why are you doing this for Imam Hussein, but you're not doing it for the, the Prophet? Peace be upon him and his holy family. What, like, how, how could we address that and explain, like, kind of address that misconception that they have? I think it's, it's a very valid question. And I think, again, as Shias, we need to accept that people have a right to ask these questions because that's how it looks to other people outside. Mm. So, you know, the whole concept of um, do the Shias do shirk by going to the zari of the imams and, and asking for, you know, um, for their wishes and things. All of these questions are valid questions that need to be answered by the Shias. And, mm. and we have answers for them. So this question that you asked, um, Sorry, let me just answer that question because I'm sure people, the, the viewers will think, okay, she's brought a question, but she's not answering it. So, no, we don't um, do shirk because we're asking the aima to ask on our behalf, one, or we're asking God because of his love for the aima, two, or we're asking the aima directly because God has given them that right. So we yeah. know that it's coming from God, not from the aima. Mm. Okay, so it's not shirk at all because it goes back to God all, in all three aspects. At all times, yeah. yeah. Going back to your question on... Um, do we give more importance to Imam Hussain alayhi salam compared to the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? It may look like that because we have 10 days of grieving for Imam Hussain, whereas we only have one on, on the Shahada day of the Holy Prophet. But by remembering Imam Hussain, we're remembering the Holy Prophet because what was the message of Imam Hussain? Mm. He stood up to bring back the religion of his grandfather. Because the religion of his grandfather, the religion of the Holy Prophet, Islam as taught by the Prophet had been corrupted so much that Imam Hussain al -Islam had to stand up and give up his life for that. So mm. by mourning for Imam Hussain al -Islam, we are really remembering the Holy Prophet and the mission that he brought. So they go hand in hand. Yeah. They, if, if the Holy Prophet wasn't there, there was nothing for Imam Hussain to stand up for. Yeah, there yeah. would be no mourning for Imam Hussain al -Islam. So by remembering Imam Hussain al -Islam, we're remembering the Holy Prophet, by remembering any of the Aima, by remembering Bibi Fatima al -Islam, by remembering Bibi Zainab al -Islam, Bibi Khadija al -Islam, any of these holy personalities, whenever we remember them, yeah. it intrinsically, it, it goes back to the Holy Prophet yeah, because they yeah. are nothing without the Holy Prophet. SubhanAllah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's, it's important for, for us to be able to tell that to our Sunni brothers and sisters that every single time we remember any of these holy personalities, we are remembering the Holy Prophet. We can't take the Holy Prophet out of them because they don't exist without the Holy Prophet. Mm. And that's why even when we say the Salawat, it is first to the Prophet and then the Ahlul Bayt because it's like they go hand in hand. Yeah. They, 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 the, the Ahlul Bayt are nothing without the Holy Prophet. And once you understand the love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had for for Imam Hussein Alaihi Wasallam, you wouldn't even ask that question because you would know that how, how how much importance from, from such a young age, how the Prophet knew the hardships that was going to occur to him. Yeah. And so, like you said, it's going back to Rasulullah, which then goes back to ultimately if, Allah subhanahu again, wa ta'ala. If you look at it from that perspective, in the Holy Quran, when, when the Holy Prophet was asked, what you know, what how can we compensate you for, for the Islam mm -hmm. that you brought us? What does Allah tell him to say? You, you look at the rest of the prophets, when they were asked this, the same question, they said, we don't need any compensation from you. Our compensation is from Allah. Now, the Holy Prophet was the greatest of the prophets. You think mm -hmm. he would be the one who'd say, my compensation is from Allah. But what does Allah tell the Holy Prophet to say? He says, I do not want anything from you except, so there is something that I want from you. I want the, you to love my near family members. SubhanAllah. Now, it's not the Holy Prophet asking for this. It's God telling the Holy Prophet to ask for it again. Why? Because by loving these holy personalities, we actually become better Muslims, better mm -hmm. Shias better human beings, we, we become closer to God. So in asking, he was actually giving. Mm. And, and this is why it's important that we love these human beings because it actually brings us closer to God. How do we understand God? It's by knowing them. How do we know how to pray? And, and, and the, the, the amazing du'as that we have are all from these amazing human, you know, human beings that God has given us in our lives. It's like we're mm. so blessed that we have so many different role models that God has given us that we can, you know, it's, we can relate to and we can learn from and actually know what it's like to actually practice Islam. Because when you're taught something in theory, it's really easy to understand it. But when you're actually shown it in practice, that's when it goes in. When you actually do it yourself, you know, it's like you, you, you see it being done and then you do it yourself. But when you actually just read it, it's like if it, it was if it was that easy, I wouldn't have to 
go to university to, to work on cadavers and things to try to figure out how to become a doctor. I could just pick up a textbook and read it. Yeah, but it's not enough. I have to be. I have to see it, and then I actually go and see the operations being done and see people doing it, so that I learn from them, and then I do it myself. Mm. So the third stage is doing it myself. First, I will learn the knowledge, then I will see it being practiced, and then I will bring it into my life. Mm. So the learning of the knowledge is is through the Holy Quran, but then seeing it is through the lives of the Holy Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt. and then putting it in practice is when I use them as role models. Yeah, and I guess when when you break that down to our Uh, our fellow Sunni brothers and sisters, they they can start to understand that. I think from the outside, when you, something unknown, something new, it's scary and intimidating. Yeah. So they see, it's like you said, shirk. That's that's the first thing they think of. Yeah. And you know, Audubillah. That's it. They don't even the the things that they would say or, or have been taught about the sh the Shia sect. You know, the list goes on. It's it's you know the, with the negativity that that does occur. Would you say? Perhaps someone like like this brother or sister who has asked an amazing question should go reach out to maybe a, a Shia center, maybe go and see a majalis or something like that, so that they can ask more questions and yeah, and sure. see it with their own eyes. And for sure, and, and I think like I think that I think it's really important that you do that, and, and I think um, all all mosques are open to mm. anyone, whether it's you're a Muslim or Shia or Sunni or, or a non-Muslim, to go in and. And actually see what's happening because no one's doing anything in hiding. Mm. We want to open it up and then show people what we're doing because we're proud of what we're doing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think yes, it's very important. But I think also it, it's important to ask. It's not you know you shouldn't just go and look because there'll be a lot of questions that come up mm. because obviously you, you're seeing things that are happening which you really don't understand. So as a non-Muslim, when you see someone praying, you don't get it. You know, it's, it's literally someone sort of doing some sort of exercise. It, that's what it looks like, and and you're thinking, oh, why? Why would you do it like that? So unless you're asking the questions and understanding the whole concept of what sujood is, and and you know why you do sujood, and you know what you're reciting, and, and actually asking those questions, then you'll understand it and actually mm. then appreciate it. In the same way, when you go into a Shia mosque and you see some practices happening, ask, and also recognize how much of its culture and how much of its religion, because in any sect, in whichever, whether it's a Sunni sect, whether it's a Shia sect, whether it's a a Muslim or a Christian or a Jewish, it doesn't matter. There is a lot of culture that comes into it as well. So actually recognizing how much of it is cultural and how much of it is actually religious mm. is important. And and asking those questions. And, and I urge our Shia brothers and sisters to actually know why they do what they're doing. Because most of the things that we do have a basis behind them. And, and we, we need to understand what the basis are. So we, we need to understand why... I'm passionate about this. Why am I am I doing it this way? What is my belief here? How can I explain it to myself and then to others? Because if I'm doing something, I need to be able to explain it. I remember um, I was in a restaurant once and there was a young lad who walked in uh, who was wearing a Zulfikar sword. Mm. And uh, the waiter happened to, he was on the table next, next to us and the waiter happened to ask him, what is that sword that you're wearing? What does it mean? And, he's, and he literally turned around and said to him, oh, it's to do with Imam Ali al Islam. And left it at that. Now, mm. what are you teaching that that waiter? It's like, you know, what does that mean to him? Nothing. Exactly. So know vague. why you're wearing it and, and explain it. Take that time out. The, the fact that this person has asked, maybe you were the one chosen by Allah to guide this person. Mm. Mm. So use that opportunity and actually explain it. And if they take it on board, alhamdulillah. And if they don't, again, alhamdulillah, at least you got the chance to explain why you're doing something. Exactly. I think as well, a lot of the time, um, Uh, a lot of Shias are quite reluctant to talk about their belief and maybe because of all of the oppression that has occurred over the years. But I, I feel that they're not open as much. That has improved a lot, I must say, especially with with females. I feel like a lot of females are actually opening up and especially uh, with other um, kind of friends and things it's from different schools. Mm -hmm. They are opening up um, and explaining. But I do still think there is some essence of fear in there and they're, they're worried that, they're going to be attacked or judged because they already know what others think of them sometimes. So, But Do you not feel that that fear is there because they themselves don't understand it? And that's why they feel like if they're being attacked, they're going to be attacked, they won't know how to answer it. I think so, yeah. If you're confident in your understanding of it, then if someone attacks you on your belief system and you can explain it, mm. then you know that if they continue the attack, then that's their problem, not yours. Yeah. And you have no problem walking away from that and saying, you know what? You're obviously not listening to me. Mm. That's fine. 
when you're ready to listen, we can pick it up again. Let's move on sort of thing, you know. And yeah. I don't feel the need to have to shove it down your throat. Mm -hmm. I don't feel the need to have to justify it because I don't need to justify it. It's obvious. I've explained it to you. Mm -hmm. Whether you accept it or not, that's your that's your journey, not mine. Exactly. Or you could guide them to someone who is more knowledgeable than you. Um, that can maybe or, you know, some websites or things like that. Yeah. So that if they if they show some sort of interest, yeah. it's always good to direct them Into in some somewhere. sort of direction yeah, so that no, for sure. they can go and research because you might be shocked, you know, they may just, you know, all of a sudden, subhanAllah, it was just meant to be, they were supposed to come yeah. towards Ahl al-Bayt and then that ripples onto their families and families and, you know, it, it changes. Yeah, no, you know, for a sure. Whole, you know, the whole family could, could change. Yeah, for sure. You, but you I just think, never know. I think you have to make sure that you do the first explanation before you refer course, them. Because I feel yeah. like if you just refer them, then it looks like you yourself don't know. Yeah, I know. And they're not going to bother then doing the research. Mm. So if you've whetted their appetite by actually explaining it to a certain degree, and then say, look, if you're interested, why don't you look up this website? Or why don't you talk to this scholar? Or, you know, sort of thing. Or take them to a scholar. Or why don't you come with me to the next Majalis? Or, you know, where you know a certain scholar is going to be speaking, which, you know, would be interesting exactly, to them. Or something. Yeah. Then yes. But if you just say to them, oh, yeah, well, if you want to know more, go to this website, they're not going to bother. No, you need to kind of intrigue them yes, a bit exactly. and make them understand actually that what they were thinking or any misconceptions were wrong. And yeah. then they do want to naturally. Exactly. You you always want to search for the truth all the time. Sure. Um, inshallah. But thank you so much for us. That we could probably have gone on a lot longer with this. But I am also very glad that this uh, individual has ask this question it's always good for them to ask because if you don't ask you're not you're not going to understand so um thank you so much Marzuma, and inshallah um all of our viewers have benefited from this even our um, brother and sisters from other sex um please do you know continue to ask questions um and and don't be afraid to ask any questions and inshallah we will um try and continue answering as many of your queries and concerns um, with Maxima Jafar, inshallah. And thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again for another episode of Dear Maxima. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.